Amen, amen. Have a be seated, everybody. Hey, let's give a hand to the worship team. Thank you so much. And especially for Lizelle, thank you so much for the, for the solo there. I, we, we look forward to future solos as well, yes? Yes, is that okay, everybody? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's really important, uh, guys, those songs that you all played, every single one of them, brought back a lot of memories, you know, when, we were, when I was younger, singing worship songs. And, but all those songs just made such a connection about how much we truly, truly need God in our lives, especially right now, everyone. Does it feel like things are just crazy? You know, more so than usual, <laughs> I should say, right? And so much more, the crazier it gets, the more we need Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, we continue our, our uh, study in the parables. <clears throat> I'm going to start off with a question. And I love to start off with questions. And it's probably one that you've been asked before, but I'm going to ask it again. And it's this. What do you value most in life? Okay. What do you value most in life? Again, I'm asking you, what is it that is just stands out that's super important to each and every one of you that you truly, truly value? Now, if I were to guess, and if I were a mind reader, I think, and depending on what stage of life that you're in, I would think it would be something like family, right? Who, who values their family? Sure, amen, right? Values your family. How about things like my children? Some of them, no, just kidding. All of them, <clears throat> yeah, I know, I just did that for laughs. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> my health, right? That's a very important thing that we truly value. Friendships. How about friendships, everyone? How many value your friendships, right? No one likes to be alone, right? We need our friends in our lives. And those relations and of, relationships, and of course, if you're religious, well, what? Your faith. Very, very well valuable. <clears throat> what we value is often influenced to everyone by culture, by parents, and by circumstances in life, right? The things that we value. Now, if you've grown up in an Asian household, the value of what is super high? What's that? Education, right? <clears throat> education, success. But the only way to success is what? Good education. So if you've grown up that way, you know that's something that, that is of great value to Asian families if you are going to again succeed. And with that being said, the people that told you, told you that was who? Your parents, right? It's our parents that pass on these core values, what's important in our families to each and every one of us. And we tend as children to adopt those same or similar values. Circumstances as well, everyone, influence what we value in life. Without being too specific, you might have gone through some sort of you know, health scare or some sort of trial, really serious trial, and it changes your perspective about what's important and what's what, what's not, okay? Values, too, everyone, also change, okay? According to a recent report <clears throat> by the Wall Street Journal, values in the U.S. of patriotism, having children and religion are significantly lower in young people than compared to 20 years ago. Yeah, you can read. Read the paper. That's true, isn't it? Values that were once that my generation esteemed, well, not so much with this younger generation. <clears throat> what we value is what we have placed our worth into. It is what we hold dear and important in our lives. Our values form the foundation of our life. They dictate the choices you make and determine the direction well, that your life will take. Your values will influence your decisions related to your relationships, to your career, and other activities that you engage in. Now, as Christians, everyone, we have all those similar values as anyone else, even that they don't believe in Jesus. But that's the difference, isn't it? The one thing we value is beyond that is what? Our faith and our hope in Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen for that? Right? We value the lessons that Jesus teaches us how to live. We value the eternal salvation and which he brings to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what makes us totally different. See, I want us to, to start off with this kind of a long uh, sentence here, or two sentences put together, actually, <clears throat> is this. When all is said and done in life, the most valuable thing that a Christian will have is eternal salvation. Knowing this truth, we ought to live in love for Jesus while we are on earth and sharing in this truth 
with others. Is that too long, everyone? No? But does it make sense? The very thing that's going to be the most important when all is said and done, no matter how much you've amassed in life, what you've succeeded in or whatever, the last thing, the most valuable thing will be your eternal salvation. And again, knowing that everyone should shape us and how we do and live and love while we are still on this earth. I want you to hang on to that as you hear this sermon. See, as we continue in our series in picking apart the parables, we're still in Matthew 13. This is like our third week in Matthew 13, because Jesus is telling parable after parable after parable. I'm just kind of highlighting what these mean, because it's talking about <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven. And in the context of talking about the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is, again, is giving these different parables, teaching the disciples and other people that were there listening on about the importance of spreading the gospel and expanding the kingdom of heaven. Right? You all with me? Right? And remember, these disciples are hearing this all for the first time. And they were probably, again, still confused. Again, he's here telling all these parables. What do these things mean? And perhaps you're thinking, again, why is this so important? Why is this so important that we need to know about the kingdom of heaven? Why is this so important that one day you're going to use us to spread the gospel and create churches? What is so important about this? Well, Jesus gives us the ne next set of parables to talk about the kingdom of heaven and its incredible value. Okay? That the kingdom of heaven is so very valuable. So let's take a look at what he says here. What is known as the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl. The parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl. Again, a very short passage here that we're going to pick apart. Okay? So let's read. It's a very easy passage. <clears throat> Jesus continues and says this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. <clears throat> then he tells another parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he had bought it. So let's break this down a little bit more, okay, to help us understand the context of what he's talking about. So Jesus provides two example, examples of what the kingdom of heaven is like. And the first one is this. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure. Ooh, there's a hidden treasure. All right. <clears throat> what does that usually uh, make you think of? Pirates, right? Pirates of the Caribbean. How many love Pirates of the Caribbean, that full franchise? All right. Some of you. Okay. It was entertaining. Johnny Depp. There you go. Okay. Need I say more? But it always talks about some sort of a hidden treasure, some sort of hidden treasure. Okay. And it's no different in this context as well. But we have to understand something in terms of, of, of what he's explaining here. Because back in that era, banks obviously did not exist right? And it was a common practice to bury money and belongings in the ground. This is what people did. There were no banks. They were too worried, well, if people break into our homes, they're going to steal it. So what better way to do it? We hide it in the ground. We'll big a, dig a big hole, stick it in there, whatever, boxes, coins, money, you know, souvenirs, whatever, they go into that ground. So all these valuable things would be basically stashed away. I remember my mom used to do that, right? I don't know about your parents. My mom back in those days didn't trust banks either, right? I think it's the older Asians, they don't trust banks. They may steal it anyways. So she would hide jewelry in different places like a sugar jar. I'm telling you all your secrets. You're going to break into my mom's house now, okay? And the sugar jars. And, you know, we used to tease my friend's parents. We always say, ooh, can I cut into your dad's mattress? Because I know that's where he keeps all his money, right? It's, it's, they're stashing it away. So in essence, again, what are they doing? Well, they're burying their hidden treasure. Okay, they're burying their hidden treasure. Well, what would happen, however, was this. The person that stashed away their money and valuables, and they hid it in the ground, right? They buried it in the ground. Well, what happens when they die? No one knows where's the hidden treasure because it's truly hidden, right? No one knows where they buried this, this treasure, all this stuff. So you can imagine when a parent dies, their kids are like, hey, where's everything? Well, tough. You're going to have to go find it. Well, what would happen then? Someone would happen to stumble along. Who knows what they're doing? They're digging. They happen to be digging a hole, too. Maybe they're trying to plant a plant. I don't know what it is. And all of a sudden, they stumble upon what? We found treasure. Wouldn't that be cool? Right? Have you ever found treasure before? Anybody? Like, you dug a hole. Like, oh, my gosh. You know, I found a lucky penny or something like that. 
right? But this is treasure, but here's the deal. They couldn't take it. Because by the rights and customs during that time, it doesn't belong to you. Even if you found it, it wasn't kind of like when you were a kid, remember? Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Do you remember saying that? I haven't said that in like 50 years, okay? Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. It's mine. Sorry, I found it first. No, back in those days, you found it. It belonged to who? The landowner. Whoever owned that land owned what was on their property, even if it's someone that found it. So that's why when, you, when Jesus explains this, he says, what did they do? They hid it again because it wasn't theirs. They didn't want to get in trouble, so they put it back in the ground. But the only way they were going to get it legally was how? They sold everything and bought the land. So they became the rightful landowner. So this lesson, everybody is not talking about how to rightfully get hidden treasure on someone else's land. That's not what the lesson's about. The lesson is this. He was willing to give up everything in order to get that hidden treasure. You with me, everybody? He gave up everything to give up to, to get that treasure that was on that land. And he gave up everything with great joy. Not too many of us equate giving up everything and joy in the same sentence, do we? But he did because why? There was such great value in obtaining that hidden treasure. You know, everyone here in the U.S. and some other countries around the world, Sharing and accepting the gospel, again, is really not an issue. I kind of said that in my prayer earlier, okay? But in other countries in Asia and the Middle East, everyone sharing and receiving the gospel could get you in a lot of trouble. It can get you arrested. It could also get you what? Killed. Can you believe that? It could actually get you killed. Yet some missionaries, okay, we just went through Missionary Emphasis Month not too long ago, continue to share the gospel in spite of the risk. It's amazing when I really think about some of these missionaries and where they go and what they do and what they've given up in life. Again, they will give up their way of life and trade it. They'll trade it in order to share the gospel. Again, they treat it as this. There's this hidden treasure that they want to share with others. But it's going to come at a cost. It costs the very life that they have. They trade in everything in order to share this hidden treasure, everyone. And equally are as amazing, it's the people that they reach for the gospel, right? That are willing to trade and give up everything in order to be part of the kingdom of heaven. See, they value their faith in Christ above all things. And we tend again not to see that type of zeal here in the U.S. Is that true or is it just me? Right? I don't see that here too much in, 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 the, in our churches, but I've seen it around the world. Again, you guys all know that I've done a lot of missions in China, and we do underground missions. That means that, hey, this is, this is kind of dangerous stuff, where people are, are worshiping with the threat of being arrested and persecuted. And I've seen people who have shared their, and heard their testimony after testimony of, of, of accepting Jesus into their hearts and loving the gospel so much that they have been disowned by family members for believing in Jesus. Have you ever been disowned by your family before? And for Asian people, that's a big thing, right? I disown you. My mom and dad used to threaten me if I didn't do what they said. We're going to disown you. I'm like, fine. <laughs> you know, I don't know what that means, okay? But in that culture, that's a huge thing. You're, that means basically you're alone and you've shamed us. Or, or they, they've given up, they've actually been kicked out of school because the colleges are government run. When they found, find out that students are believing in Jesus and attending these churches, they threaten, you're not coming back to this school and we're going to kick you out. Which, if you get kicked out of school, what does that do? It brings shame upon them and their parents get involved. But they're willing to give all that stuff up. Why? Because the joy of the gospel. They don't care in the sense of being persecuted and arrested because they feel it's all worth it. And they're willing to sacrifice everything for it. Can you believe that, everyone? See, probably none of you have seen that. So it doesn't mean a lot to you. But I'm telling you, one day, I hope you get to go where I, get to, where I go to see the true trials that other Christians experience. And it helps you put things in perspective here in the United States even more. It's a treasure, everyone, that's worth far more than anything else in their lives that they're willing, again, to sacrifice. 
You know, I want us, I don't know if I phrase this correctly, why this is, uh, why they do this. Because I kept thinking, why do they do this? Why in the United States this doesn't happen, but here you value so much and you sacrifice everything? Well, I think it's this, <clears throat> that the value of the kingdom of heaven gives us value on earth. Does that make sense? I was kind of trying to phrase this correctly. The value of the kingdom of heaven gives us value on earth. Let me try to explain it this way. You know, I remember speaking at a small church um, in China, <clears throat> and it was mostly made up of, of older women. And that's the tendency that you will see. It's mostly females that attend these house churches, right? Some of you have done house church ministries, and that's probably true. And so I remember I, I, I was asked to speak pretty late. It was like 8 p.m., and I had already done so much other stuff in that day, and I wasn't quite prepared. And so they said, hey, you just got to go, man. They're expecting you, man. You're, you're the missionary. You got to come in. I'm like, fine, all right? And I'll be honest with you. I was a little perturbed because I was so tired. I'm not going to lie to you, okay? But once I walked in, this is amazing what the Holy Spirit does and put something in my heart. And, and the Holy Spirit said this, told me this, tell them they are not a mistake. Tell them they are not a mistake. So I did it. It was in my heart. I said, okay, I'm going to do it, guy. I don't know what's going on because I have nothing prepared here. And so I, I got up, they introduced me, and I started walking around all these ladies and placing my hand on their shoulder. And I kept saying, you're not a mistake. You're not a mistake. You're not a mistake, right? And I'm getting translated, obviously, right? <clears throat> but right when I started touching everyone saying you're not a mistake, the whole room just started crying. Every single person was just crying. Tears are flowing. They're wailing. You know, it's uncontrollable. And I'm going, wow. <laughs> I'm good, you know? <laughs> no, I didn't do that at all. I'm thinking, this is what the Holy Spirit said, said to me to tell them, because it was something that was so significant in their lives. They kept crying because why? There was this connection. Because when I shared that God does not make mistakes in creating them, it told them this, that there is value. I have value. That Jesus would die on the cross for me and allow me to join heaven. Because to them, they're thinking, oh, that's only for special people, right? That's only for, the, for those that deserve to go. They didn't realize, hey, you deserve it too. But that value was placed upon you because of Jesus, not because of what you've done. Do you understand, everyone? See, a lot of cultures don't understand this, this concept of grace. They always feel like it's conditional. So they work hard and hard to try to achieve it. And so every time they fail, they feel what? Worthless. But no, that's not the gospel, everyone. So when I told them that, it was amazing. After the service was done, lady, all these ladies kept coming up to me to thank me to, and reminding them that my husband's been telling me I've been a worthless wife all my life. But I know that's not true. And I said, that's not true. I had a woman coming to me with a disability that said the same thing to me. She said, my husband said I should have died at birth. Right? L literally. Right? But... I'm not worthless. I said, no, you're not. I had another woman came up to me as well, and she said, I was adopted. Why? Because my birth parents threw me in the field because there were too many girls in our family, and they didn't need another mouth to feed, and they left me to die because I'm worthless. But that's not true, is it? I said, that's not true. Do you understand, everyone, this value that the kingdom of heaven gives to us? And I want us to be able to embrace that, everyone. See, in the U.S., our value tends to be based on worldly standards and not by the gospel of Jesus. So let me ask you this again. How much do you treasure the joy of the gospel in your life? How much do you treasure the joy of the gospel in your own life? And I think that's very important for us to put into perspective how much we treasure the gospel in our lives relative to the things that we actually treasure. You know what I mean? I think if I held up my iPhone, everyone probably, that's on the top of their list. I treasure my iPhone, or Samsung for some of you, right? Because why? The phone represents your life. Everything for your life is on what? That phone. And I could prove it to you. If I hid your phone, what would you do? What? You'd freak out, all right? I freaked out when my phone broke a few months ago. My wife left her phone in a rental car not too long ago, and they haven't mailed it back yet. And everyone's saying, when are you getting your phone? I can't get a hold of it. And everything is just crazy because of a phone. Well, everyone, if you were to list all the things that you treasure in life, I want to ask yourself, 
in that list, say it's 1 through 10, where does the gospel come in? I know it's not 1. I hate to say that. Is it 2? 3? 4? 5? Let's just jump all the way to 10. Did it make the list? I think I made my point, right? I really physically want you to do that. Hey, I got to do that myself too. Okay, You're, I'm not just pointing your, the finger at you, but myself as well. Let's move on. Jesus gives another parable as well, and he talks about how valuable the kingdom of heaven is, and he uses this, a pearl. Okay, he talks about the pearl, and the pearl has, has been for centuries highly valued for their beauty, and even, guess what, for their mythology. There is some superstition in the Middle East about pearls. And I'll tell you what it is. See, a lot of the Arabs <clears throat> believed these gems were the, were the result of the tears of the gods. So when they cried, they, they created, they formed tears that ended up in oysters. <laughs> okay? How many of you guys like oysters? Raw oysters? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, good thing there's pearls in there because raw oysters, uh, that's not for me. But some of you, I don't know why. But hey, I heard they're delicious. Okay? And also, too, even for the Greeks, believed that the goddess of love Aphrodite shed her pearls of tears. So there was something mythological and superstitious behind getting and obtaining these type of pearls. And pearls, again, were highly valued as a gemstone, as they still are today. But unlike any other gemstones, you don't unearth them. They only come from the sea in, in, in an oyster of all things. Isn't that the craziest thing? And I heard why they created it is that you had to put it like a grid of sand or something in an oyster, and that forms the pearl. Isn't that crazy? Even if now in modern technology for farming, that's what they do. They will physically put sand inside of, of, a, of an oyster in order to create a pearl. Okay. I remember buying my wife. I think one of my first gifts was pearls, right? Right. It was a bracelet, but they were freshwater pearls. Anybody know the difference between freshwater pearls and, and ocean pearls? Freshwater pearls are not as pretty, because I was poor. <laughs> I, I couldn't afford it, right? But you still like them, right? Okay, thank you. That's all I need to know. I feel better now. Pearls, everyone, there's probably too much information that you need to know here. We're, we're harvested both from the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea. That's why, they were, that's why they're in the scripture. And at one point, even this, the Middle East produce, was a top producer of pearls until they overfished them, overharvested them. Now you can't get them anymore. And I think it's China that creates the most pearls, like everything else in the world, right? So like any other precious gems, like gold or diamonds, pearls were highly valued, and the merchants would give up whatever they could in order to obtain these precious gems. Well, what I find remarkable is this, everyone, and it's because I watch too much National Geographic, okay? I like documentaries and history and stuff like that. It's not so much the merchants that gave up everything to obtain these pearls, as Jesus said, okay? Again, that just alludes back to this, what are you willing to give up? I like to really focus this is on the people that actually harvested the pearls. Does that make sense, right? They just don't float to the top, okay? There was a time where they would have to do what? They would have to die for these pearls, okay? They would have to risk life and limb, freezing cold. Um, they have to risk sharks. Can you imagine sharks drowning? You know how deep they would have to go? Sometimes 30 feet. Have any of you dove to 30 feet without scuba gear? This is what they've done for centuries and centuries. As a matter of fact, that doesn't exist anymore in Europe and in the Middle East, but you know it still exists in one group in Japan, and they're called the Amaz, all right? Again, too much National Geographic. But they are trained from age 12. Since the 8th century, these ladies primarily have been doing exactly what I just described. And they are trained from 8 years of age even to 80 years of age. They're still doing this. But now they use kind of scuba gear just because it's easier. But prior to that, they risked life and limb, everyone. To why? To, to obtain such a valuable treasure. And what I see is this. There's this incredible dedication. There's this incredible courage. There's this incredible perseverance to, in pursuit of such a valuable item. Everyone, what does that say about us and how we value the kingdom of heaven? To put simply, how much do you value the gospel again in your life? More so, to what extent will you go to live out your faith so the gospel can be proclaimed? What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to risk? And like these pearl divers, everyone, will you display the dedication, the courage, 
the perseverance in order to, for others to know the gospel so they can become part of the kingdom of heaven. Amen? These are the questions I want you to ask yourself today. Again, what is it that you value and treasure in life? I hope that, that your faith and hope in Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ is what you truly value. Let me leave you with a reminder that Jesus says this and also in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, 19 through 21. And he says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen? Amen. Let's all pray. Father God, we thank you again for this time together. We thank you for your word through the parables. And especially today to ask us, to teach us, Lord, how valuable the kingdom of heaven is and how valuable it should remain in our lives. That it should influence how we live on earth for what we, for what we hope in the future. I pray, Lord, that this has moved the hearts of people here to really evaluate how much the gospel means to them. Where does it rank in all the other treasures in life and how much more it needs to be ahead of all those other things? So, Father God, we are reminded about the great work that you've done, Lord, through your son, Jesus Christ, through the gospel, that his body was broken for us and his blood was shed. As we go into communion now, I ask that everyone take a moment of silence to talk with God right now confess your sins, and make yourselves right. So why don't you do that for another minute or so.